Hi, this is The Philosophical Angle, and I am your host, Chris Angle. The Philosophical Angle defines concepts in current media. I am the author of four books on philosophy, one of which is The Philosophical Equations of Economics, and this can be seen at, along with the other books at www.philosophypublishing.com. Along with me is my panelist, Rick Samuelson. He graduated from Yale, has an MBA from Tufts and from Wharton. And Rick is an independent investor and currently retired from the investment banking industry. Welcome, Rick. Thank you. The purpose of the philosophical angle is to examine the nature of the concepts and topics in current media and compare its essence with the usage and circumstances in how they're being used. This week, our subject matter is the deficit, the Fed, and the economy. And so let's begin. Lately, in the media, there is a tremendous interest in where the economy is going. Often we've seen uh, newspaper reports of the declining gross domestic product. And if it's declining, there are questions as to how the economy will go in the future. So economists often on TV and pundits will exclaim uh, their viewpoints of the future. But how can they calculate the future? So here today, we'll, uh, we'll try to examine this problem. So first, on any economy, <coughs> you have various types of influence and today's influence for, certainly comes from Europe, the Fed, and production of new uh, transactions for the economy, whether that's growth. So the essence of growth is the efficiency of the transactions that make up an economy. So any economy is, if you add up all the individual transactions, that happen, such as going into a store and buying some food, that's indicative of the, of the gross domestic product. And all transactions are made up of the risk of the, of the transaction, the information and knowledge used in the products and services of the transaction, the time spent in producing that service or, or, or good and the effort, along with the material, if it's a good. And new production is affected when one of these ingredients of the, pr of the service or good has become more efficient. And when it becomes more efficient, it allows the, it'll filter through the economy, and the economy becomes more efficient. Thus, the resources can be reallocated to investment and expansion. So the, basics, the basic need of a growing economy is the further, efficiency, the further efficiencies to be developed within that transaction of the risk, the information, knowledge, time, and effort. And so most of the efficiencies that come about in a, in a modern economy is through the increase of knowledge and thus producing new inventions and new efficiencies. So with that said, let's analyze the current economy. Europe has a negative GDP most recently of negative 0.2%. This affects our economy because if Europe is a major trading partner of the U.S. The Federal Reserve affects the economy 
in two ways. One, it has produced a low interest rate. That's an efficiency of sorts, allowing businesses to, businesses to borrow at efficient rates, making them their allocation of capital more efficient. But the Federal Reserve also, in its quest for low interest rates, is also producing a great deal of money just by writing out checks and printing it away. And one of the major benefactors of this is the U.S. government. It, it buys the securities of the U.S. government or loans to the U.S. government, and then it presently is forgiving its interest. Nice deal. So consequently, there is inflation. And I suspect that inflation is probably in its nascent level. It probably hasn't really taken off as it might in the future. Anytime there's an uh, inflation, it's a, a deterrent on savings. It's a tax. And those who save are being taxed when, it, when inflation is generated by the Federal Reserve. So we have these three negative influences. Well, the low interest is a positive. So we've got the positive of, a new, of new production of, of the economic transactions produced by new knowledge in a, uh, that's being produced by the American uh, uh, people. We have the negative influence of a declining Europe, the negative influence of inflation produced by the Federal Reserve, the positive influence of low interest rates. But along with that inflation and the QE3 and the QE2 and 1 that preceded it, this is to handle the large government deficit. Large government deficits means the government spending a lot of money, more than it should. And when governments spend a lot of money, there's necessarily a misallocation of capital. And the reason for that is governments by nature are not as efficient as private enterprise. So you get a significant amount of misallocation of resources that would otherwise be in a privately run economy. And thus, we have seen a U.S. decline in, in its GDP. Although it remains positive, it has declined significantly over this last year. In addition to the misallocation of resources, you have government regulations and laws put out by, the, by Congress and its ag government agencies, and in which the, uh, the executive branch puts into effect. These also prevent GDP from expanding. Look at the EPA. Look how that has devastated the energy industry. Moratoriums on drilling. Pipelines not being allowed to, uh, to expand and to bring more oil into the U.S. economy or to export more oil or, or whatever it is. So you have a negative here with the inefficient allocation of government of of private resources by the government. So we've got three negatives, and if uh, actually four, if we add in the regulations and laws that uh, that are coming into effect through the various agency government agencies, such as the the EPA. So we have a lot of negatives here, and just a few positives. Whether the positives can outweigh all these negatives, well, the economists will have to just add these up and see what they can come to. So overall, let's, let's just um, let's review the overall situation. We look here at the European economy and its debt burden, which means misallocation of resources, and its deficits produced by a European government.
these payments have become suspect and are now possibly coming to default unto the creditors uh, such as Greece, uh, may spo so, uh, Spain may soon follow. And when you get default, you'll get the realization of, of the loss of assets of a creditor. And a creditor is somebody who once produced an economic transaction, profited from it, expanded, and suddenly he will realize that he has not these assets anymore. This is a definition of a recession. The realization of the loss of assets is a recession. Well, is the U.S. economy following the methodology here of misallocation of, of resources as it's happening in Europe? Let's go to our panelist. Let's go to Rick and ask him what he thinks about this situation. Rick? Well, uh, what I find remarkable is the extent to which the errors of the subprime crisis are being essentially repeated with federal debt. Of course, in the subprime, subprime crisis, uh, the, the situation leading up to that was uh, interest rates were artificially low. Uh, the risk, the credit risk, essentially associated with these subprime mortgages, whether they were packaged or, or not, uh, was, was not priced correctly, uh, underpriced, if you will. And uh, this allowed the bubble to expand to uh, excessive proportions none of which was spotted by the Fed until uh, days or hours or weeks before the, the bubble burst. So the Fed showed, and I think this is critical, no ability whatsoever to forecast uh, that um, financial crisis. And here we have, in the wake of that, um, a bubble in federal debt, essentially, with again interest rates being artificially low and so the US government is able to borrow the US government has increased its debt outstanding by roughly 50 percent in four years and is not paying a higher interest rate let me repeat that the United States government has increased its debt by 50 percent in four years and is not paying a higher interest rate in fact it's paying a lower interest rate right how is that possible exactly. without the interference of the Fed? Okay. And so, because, because, as you point out, the federal government is obviously not investing. It's wasting money. Because if it were investing, we wouldn't have uh, an unemployment problem. The, the economy would be roaring. If you're, if you're investing wisely, to the point of, of, of racking up a trillion dollar deficit every year, there would be, by definition, a return on that capital by now. And there has been no evidence of that whatsoever. Right. And so and the end result of this is that what we are observing in the commodities markets, whether it's the price of gold or other commodities, is that the dollar is being debased and will continue to be debased. Uh, inflation is actually occurring, it's just not measured in, you know, the conveniently uh, modeled CPI that the Fed chooses to follow. And in the end, uh, as, hap as happened with Greece and Spain and many others, uh, there will come a day of reckoning. And once that day of reckoning comes, the true cost of this excessive debt and excessively growing debt will be realized, and the United States will face another crisis. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, uh, I I agree with that assessment, and uh, you mentioned uh, you used the word bubble. 
Uh, this has been a news of, this has been a word in vogue in the media of the past. Do you mean by, when you say bubble, you're, uh, that's another word for misallocation as we, as we use it here in our little chart, uh, in our, actually in our charts, both of them. Uh, is that equivalent to a misallocation? I, I would say a misallocation is the result of bubble conditions. Bubble conditions are defined as a growth in debt which is in excess of the creditors, I'm sorry, the debtors' part ability to service it. Okay? So if your income's growing at 5% a year and your debt is growing at 20% a year, uh, by definition, you're experiencing a bubble. Okay. Because uh, in, a, in very short order, actually, your ability to service that debt, whether it's interest uh, or interest in principle, uh, will disappear. Okay. And, and, and or certainly decline. Right. And that's what's happening to the U.S. government right now. Just, and it's exactly the same thing that happened to uh, mortgage uh, debtors uh, a few years ago. So uh, you were prognosticating actually a second bubble forming now um, over the remains of the first one. Yes. Okay. And, and the first one, as you can, the great enabler. Okay, and the first one was uh, uh, due to subprime mortgages. And so maybe could you run uh, uh, summarize the formation of that second bubble from the uh, from the ashes of the subprime bubble yes okay but the essence of the second bubble is from federal reserve interest rates the, the federal debt that's growing the federal at debt an unsustainable pace okay and it will uh, come to uh, to such a degree that it'll push the U.S. government into default possibly in the future, or at least into such heavy payments that there'll be a tremendous me uh, uh, reallocation of payments that, uh, that are presently involved with the U.S. government. Is, is that yeah, how I read it? You put a number to it as well. Uh, you know, what do we pay in interest payments now on the federal government debt? It's uh, I think two or three hundred billion. Uh, well, if interest rates normalized to above five percent, which is what they were historically. You know, that that number rises to close to a trillion very quickly, a year. <laughs> right. And the federal government takes in about what one point three presently. That'll be a tremendous. Uh, yeah. That's right. Okay. It's spending about 2.3 presently. Is that about right? So we add uh, to it another it's, trillion? Well, it's, no, it's, the government, federal government takes in about 2.5 trillion and spends about 3.5. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And if we add to it the uh, higher interest rates in the future, uh, that'll have to return due to inflation. Uh, and if they just normalize at 5%. We add in another trillion dollars worth of payments. Yes, right. We're looking at a uh, at an economy probably uh, going back here to uh, to a European economy, the conversion of the U.S. economy to a European economy. Rick, is there any hope for uh, for the U.S. at this situation? Well, the, the one hope would be that. It, it, assuming Mr. Romney is elected and takes on board the severity of the situation, uh, he has the power to appoint the head of the Federal Reserve and certainly the influence to ensure that the when Bernanke leaves or in 2014 his term is up, uh, action is taken quickly to normalize interest rates and normalize, frankly, Fed policy. And it w will temporarily be painful for the United States, uh, as it was under Volcker and Reagan, uh, but what will come out of it will be a much healthier economy 
uh, in the years to come. Okay, uh, that certainly happened under Reagan. Um, however, is that trillion dollars additional of coming burden on the U.S. too much or will overpower the ability of the economy to add to its GDP as opposed to its presently it's declining. So let's say a new politician comes in, uh, he strikes the regs and laws, helps the, uh, gets the Fed uh, to, uh, uh, to go back on, uh, into policies for a strong dollar, uh, interest rates rise, the burden, uh, therefore, on the economy rises, or on the deficit rises uh, tremendously. Will the positives coming into the economy, such as new production, uh, lessening of laws and regulations, will that be enough to offset the problem that we've discussed here today of the blooming deficit and the low interest rates, which will, pre which will soon go to market rates. What do you, what do you, uh, what do you forecast, Rick? Well, well I, I don't consider the current, I mean, notwithstanding what the Obama camp says, I don't consider the current situation any worse than it was uh, in the early 80s, with the exception that our federal debt levels are much, much higher as measured relative to the economy and on a per capita basis or any other basis you can choose. So, so with that exception, I don't, I, if, if you recall under Carter, interest rates were already starting to rise. Inflation was already in place. In fact, we had stagflation. Unemployment was high. At one point when Volcker was trying to bring this under control, we had you know, double digit interest rates it was a very severe situation, um, and this is a, a, a similarly severe situation uh, with somewhat different parameters. Uh, but the United States economy began to kick in the gear, what, a couple of two or three years later, and you could already see the stock market starting to recover, and the GDP growth recovering, and investment recovering. So. I think with the right policies, the United States uh, economy would turn around more quickly than most people think. Let me put it that way. Okay. okay. So your uh, your vision for the future is that the U.S. economy will be able to its natural animal instincts, to use a, an an economic term of the past will be able to overcome the federal deficit and its misallocation of resources and allow us to become the America that we were once before, similar to the recover, recovery of Reagan. So is this time the deficit still manageable enough to be able to recover? Your view on that? Uh, yes, uh, yes, that, it is. Um, it would take very severe cutbacks in spending. It would take a lot of political will and a lot of leadership from the president and, and Congress to, to make it happen. Um, is that political will there? Will it, it be, be done? Is that political will uh, uh, available? Do you think it's uh, there's enough of it uh, in the making to? Uh, to be able to uh, effect such a result? Uh, well, I wish I could be more confident of that. Uh, but until we actually see the results of the election, and until we see uh, a new chief executive in action, it's very, very hard to uh, prognosticate on, on, on that outcome. Okay. So let's... Let's just go ahead and make a, a summary for those, uh, for those viewers interested in 
how we see the economy and, and really the stock market in two also in the near and, and uh, long term. What's your, uh, what's your view on the stock market, the economy, uh, in the next uh, six to 12 months? Well, on a six month view, I'm pretty pessimistic because we're just entering into a recession. Uh, Europe's already in it, fans in it. We probably are very close. Uh, so, and, and you can see in the earnings revisions that are coming out that uh, it's headed down. Uh, but uh, it could be uh, that if we get new leadership in and if the right policies are put in place, uh, you could within uh, the next year or two see the stock market start to recover and anticipate that uh, the United States at least uh, will begin um, recovering. The GDP growth rates will begin recover, earning to recover, earnings will, will start to recover. That's, that's the most optimistic scenario. And that's the if one that was uh, was in Reagan's time. Uh, I think it took about two years. Uh, it wasn't until 1982 right. that uh, things started to turn around. Right, right. Um, so it's not going it's not going to be pretty for the next couple of years. It, 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 it would be very surprising to me. But very surprising that it would recover before that. Is yeah. that yeah okay? I uh, I tend to agree. I think. Uh, that the number of negatives here that we've got in place, their influence will extend out into the future for another year or so until the, uh, these negatives can become positives. And in doing so, there's going to be a lot of hardship, as Rick mentioned, uh, for, the, uh, for, for the economy as a whole. Last thoughts, Rick. You know, oh, you know, you mentioned earlier uh, the price of gold. I uh, made some notes here. Uh, gold um, in 2007 was at $870 approximately. 2010 it was 1,200 uh, approximately, a little bit uh, more than that. And at the end of uh, 2011 it was uh, 1,570 or so, and and now it's in the 1,600s. Uh, that's a, a, a real indication of the inflation that, uh, that we've been talking about today. And, it's, um, um, uh, and that'll be uh, devastating too, uh, as that takes away from the savers of society and uh, gives to the government. Uh, final thoughts, Rick. We've got uh, about 20 seconds. Uh, well, what dismays me uh, so much is the degree to which the lessons of the subprime crisis were totally lost on uh, the Federal Reserve. You know, the, this is a, they're supposed to be independent, they're supposed to take a long-term view. Uh, instead, it seems like a very politicized organization that is uh, doing its best to support spendthrift policies uh, from a democratic uh, liberal administration. Okay. I want to thanks Rick, uh, thank Rick for joining us, and uh, thank you, and we'll see you next time here at the Philosophical Angle.